I'm glad to see everyone having such a wonderful time in the song service today. Much cheerful laughter. we are pleased to see it. Uh, good to see everybody again today. Got a, a full house, and very, we are all very welcome. I hope you'll be back again and again. Uh, one thing I wanted to call everybody's attention, especially those of you who will be listening to us on a tape program or watching video later, is that uh, we are hosting the third annual family retreat this year, and we will be at Memorial, I'm sorry, at Paris Landing State Park in Tennessee over the Pentecost and Memorial Day weekend. Everyone is invited. Everyone is encouraged to come. Bring yourself, bring your kids, because it's shaping up to be a very special weekend. We'll begin Friday night, May the 25th at 7 p.m., a fellowship evening with sandwiches, drinks, finger foods will be provided. They're going to be the next morning starting at 9 o'clock, a variety of thought-provoking and relevant seminars at 9, then at 10, YEA classes for kids from 3 years old to 20 uh, will be carrying on. Also, seminars will be continuing through that hour as well, I believe. This will happen on both Sabbath and Sunday between 10 and 11. The afternoon service that day will be led, will be led by, and his sermon will be given by, Bronson James. It will be really interesting to, this will be the first time in nearly 12 years that Bronson and I will have shared a speaking program. Uh, our paths separated a long time ago. It's wonderful that they're crossing again. It'll be very interesting to see where the Holy Spirit has taken us in our separate walks since that time. We're glad to have him with us. That evening will be the famous, no, world famous, CEM pie and ice cream social that evening. And you really wouldn't want to miss that. Because, by the way, I will be speaking on, on Sunday, which this year is on Pentecost. Because we have two Sabbaths back to back this year, Pam Dewey has come up with a very special way to celebrate Pentecost. In the morning, we'll have YEA classes and a worship service, at which I'll be speaking. The afternoon will be devoted to a Bible Times Bazaar, capturing excitement that kids and families would have felt arriving in Jerusalem at the Feast of Pentecost. If you're so inclined, put together a Bible Times costume and wear it. I have already told them that is not going to happen with me. <laughs> I will not be wearing a robe and sandals. A wide variety of booths will be set up with Bible-themed crafts, games, and activities for kids. The goal is to provide fun and education for all participants. To be followed by the important burgers, hot dogs, fixings for everybody, followed by a dance at 8 o'clock. And, of course, the old people can go on to bed at 8 o'clock if they absolutely like. <laughs> Monday morning, 9 o'clock, a brainstorming session led by Jim O'Brien. Youth free to do their own activities as they wish and plan their own. Now, here's our problem. The reason I'm telling you all this stuff today is to tell you this. To do this, we need help. It's a big event. Uh, we need volunteers to make the project come to life. If you have any ideas and are willing to help, the note says, or are willing to help. We need both of those. Uh, please contact Pam Dewey. Uh, you could also contact Skip Martin. And in case you don't have email addresses or phone numbers, call 1-888-BIBLE-44, and we'll be happy to put you in touch because there's a lot to get done. If you're going to come to make reservations, call. Here we come. Telephone number 1-88, I'm sorry, 1-800-250-8614. That's 1-800-250-8614. And give CEM's group number for your discount. That's, and the group number is 3078. And that's, for those of you who aren't planning on coming, just be patient. We'll, we'll, we'll miss you, but, uh, I have to get that out there for everybody who will be coming. And we're expecting a really good group. It, it kind of surprised us because w the last two years we've done this has not been on Pentecost. It's been Memorial Day. So all we had to work too much with was the Sabbath day. And then we had recreational activities the whole time. It was only after we had scheduled this that we realized, whoops, this is Pentecost. And so we have to approach this in a slightly different fashion. But, you know, thanks to Pam and Mona, you know, we're going to come up with like, some really interesting things, and it's going to be a fine time for all. An issue of Biblical Archaeology Review landed on my desk this week with an article in it about scholars who lose their faith. I'd known a little bit about this in times past. I wondered about it because an old friend of mine who had traveled down that road and had lost his faith, only to regain it again in a rather much altered form, perhaps to lose it all over again, I'm not sure where he is today. 
But there were four scholars featured in this article, two who lost faith and two who did not. And I couldn't help wondering if these men ever had faith in the first place. For had they had faith, would they have lost it over what I consider in many cases to be very, very minor issues, and issues really that are of only interest to scholars and graduate faculties and people who are going to do, do oral exams for doctorates, I really do wonder about it. One of the reasons uh, I, I, I didn't read very far in the article because it wasn't anything of that great interest to me, but the first fellow's faith, it seems, was badly damaged by the problem of theodicy. Now, I've introduced you to that word before. I'll bring it up for you again. It is the idea or the question of how it's possible for a good God to create a world with so much evil in it. In other words, it's a, they see this as a giant problem. Now, mind you, these are intelligent, well-read men, and some of them see this as a major problem. Candidly, I think they have lost faith in the wrong God. It's the God of somebody else's imagination. Men of faith, by the way, don't lose it. It's not something that slips out of your pocket when you get into the car like your cell phone might. They don't lose it. They cast it off. And that's where a major difference comes in. And they cast it off, in my opinion, because it becomes inconvenient. And it becomes inconvenient for a lot of reasons. One may be that they really can't bear up under the scorn of those other professors whose respect and all they have to have in order to, 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 to make it. They can't stand up under the scorn of those who will not publish articles of a certain kind. They have to fit the mold or they don't get into print. And they have to publish or perish. But I won't go too far down that road. As it happened, the article arrived at a time when I was deeply involved in another study, and that is of one of the earliest of the writing prophets. Now, I think most of us are aware of the fact that the prophets kind of divide out, not formally in the Bible, but they do divide out into former and latter. The former prophets is a term that really applies to, I think, all the way back into the time of Judges, uh, to the to First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and so forth. The time in which Elijah and Elisha, those two great powerhouses, walked up and down the land in Israel in those days, but who, as far as we know, never wrote a word on the paper or parchment. They just did their job for the time, in the time, and carried on. It's odd, in a way, that one of those men, Elijah, is the archetype of all prophets, and God tells us he's coming back. At least the spirit and the power of Elijah, he is the one who serves as the model for, what shall we say, the last of the great prophets. But then you have the latter prophets, which is composed of everybody. Really, you might just say the writing prophets. Here's a question for your trivia quiz. Which is the earliest of all the writing prophets? Who was the first one to sit down and write down what he had to say, as opposed to walking into the king's court, delivering it to the king's court, or walking down to the courthouse square and delivering it on the courthouse steps? This one wrote it down. Who do you think it was? Wasn't well, Isaiah for sure. You tend to think that because he's the first one you have in your Bible. It's Amos. I heard the word Amos come from somewhere back here. But yeah, he was the earliest of them. And something was already beginning to grow in my mind relative to one of these issues that trouble lots of people. There are two sentences in Amos. Really, they are almost proverbial. Uh, you've heard both of them, I am absolutely certain, at one time or another. Two, two sentences, but they struck me differently this time than they had before. <clears throat> Here they are. Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. Heard that before? Yeah. Second one, can two walk together except they be agreed? These two sentences, Proverbs, I mean, you hear them quoted in conversations from time to time, especially the latter one, uh, have taken on a great deal of meaning to us over the years. But to me, you know, some of these things become aphorisms, and they are often cited out of context, and they take on a different sense from what was intended. There is no question in my mind that we should give pretty careful attention to a man like Amos, who had close encounters with, with God himself, and who went to the trouble to write down what God told him. Now, more than we realize, we have created an image of God in our minds. 
I mean, you just have. You, just, you can't help yourself but to have growing in your mind an idea of what God is like. And I would say that the more developed your image is, the more likely it is to be wrong because we bring so much of ourselves into these things and the way we look at them. The chances are the way we look at things is somewhat, at least at variance, from the real thing. It may just be a good thing for us to lose the faith in the God of our imagination, which is what I'm afraid a lot of people fall, but we only need to do that so we can know the real God. Jeremiah had this to say. He said, Thus saith the Lord. You'll find this in Jeremiah, the ninth chapter, verse 23. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in this. Let him that him that glories, let him glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord that exer- exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now it's turning out, didn't it start out this way, but it's turning out that that scripture is the lead of three of the third book as well as the first two books that I have written. Every one of them is starting out now with that as the subtitle under the first chapter. That's the scripture that I cite. And the reason it's important to me is because this scripture tells me that I can understand and I can know God, but I've got to do it on his terms, not mine. And this is crucial. So what is Amos about? Let's start off with this place. Amos chapter 3, verse 7, where we one of the scriptures we just cited. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Now we have to understand something. <clears throat> Israel was in covenant with God. And what is oftentimes, I feel, not well understood is that a covenant involves commitments on both sides of the covenant. There's a tendency, I think, among people to think that these covenants of God were simply just handed down as gifts to the people. That it was a one-way street. It was all God doing good things for us and telling us how to live our lives and so forth and so on. Never considering the fact that there is a reverse obligation to the covenant that we have entered. God, I mean, we have to understand that that commitment. What this means is that God himself could not, would not allow himself to just walk away from the covenant without saying anything. You follow me? It would be like desertion. You know, a man who would get up and leave his wife and children without so much as saying a word about why he was going, where he was going, or what have you, is a man worthy of absolute contempt. God would not do that. And that's what he means when he says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. So the prophet becomes on the scene, carrying the role of telling people that if God is going to walk away from your relationship, this is precisely why he is going to walk away, and this is what you may have to do if you want to rescue it. Amos knows he can't walk away either. Because he says, the Lord Jehovah has spoken. How can I possibly hold my peace? When God has said what he has had to say, and I know what he has had to say, I can't sit on my hands. Now, from where we sit today in the 21st century, you look back on all this stuff. God has been silent for a very, very long time. Oh, I don't mean there haven't been would-be prophets and wannabe prophets and guys standing on the street corner with a sign saying, flee from the wrath to come or the end is dear. That's not what Bible prophets did. <clears throat> not at all. There's been all these years since Jesus, there has never been a world-class prophet. Notice I use that term, world-class, because Elijah was world-class. Elisha had twice of his spirit. Isaiah was world class. These prophets were men who could walk into the palace and be heard. Or they could walk down to the courthouse steps, as it were, or the gate of the city, which was the equivalent of the seat of a city government in those days. They could go down there, they could be heard in those places, and they were all known. Jeremiah was a regular. He was so regular, he came to be hated, as a matter of fact, every time he showed up at the courthouse steps. And so it was that these people... We have not seen a man like that since that time. Now, 
Does that mean that God isn't going to do anything? No prophet since the first century. Are we just out here in the dark, muddling forward with no idea of what God's up to, how he looks upon our lives, how he looks upon our government, how he looks at the world at large? Does he even give a fig what we do anymore? Well, there has been no divinely inspired prophet since, or divinely endorsed, let me put it that way, prophet, since the first century. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. No, not 11. Chapter 1, verse 1. Hebrews 1, verse 1. Here's how he kicks off this book. He says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, here's the picture. God, in times past, in various ways, under various circumstances, spoke to the fathers by Elijah, Elisha, uh, Amos, Obadiah, Isaiah, all these men. Finally, with Malachi. And with Malachi, God went silent. He had nothing more to say to these people after that. And frankly, if you want to get a feeling for why that might have been, just go back and read Malachi from front to back one more time. And you'll begin to get a feeling as to why God says, enough. A long time passed. No word from God until finally a guy named Zacharias is standing in the temple ministering to the altar of incense. In there all by himself, all by his lonesome, going about a job he had done for years. And suddenly, where nothing had been before, there stood a man. Scared him to death. And the, it was an angel of God with the first word from God in decades, generations. It was the birth of John the Baptist that was being announced and the first step along the way to the revelation of the Messiah, of the Christ, of the very Son of God. Now, in the beginning of chapter 2 of Hebrews, having made all of his points about Christ after all these years that now God has spoken to us by a son. He says this in chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, if every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Okay. Here we sit. you got the Bible in your lap there. And throughout that entire New Testament, you have the testimony of people who walked with Jesus, heard his words, saw what he did, and and experienced him, touched him, handled him, put their hands on him, had him put their hands, hands on them. These were and had Jesus hand them a cup of wine, had them hand them unleavened bread to eat as a symbol of his body. These men have testified to us what Jesus had to say. And when they all died, God went silent again. We haven't heard from him for nearly 2,000 years. Kind of sobering thing to stop and think about for a moment. Now here's my question. Why should God send us yet another prophet when he has already sent his son. And one of the one or more of the parables of Jesus kind of outlined this thing, how that God sends prophet after prophet. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. He sends his son and they kill his son. And it seems in the parable, and it seems in history, that that was it. That was the last thing he would have to say. Now, I don't expect to see another prophet, frankly. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. But that does not mean that God is not going to act. I don't think any of us would think for a moment that it would meant meant that. We, I I would think all of us have an impending sense, actually, that God is going to act in, in men's affairs. And in fact, Jesus, John, the others make it very clear that at the time of the end, he will. But why aren't we getting a prophet then? Well, after all, we a long time have had men like Amos who've already given us the word. 
I'm just now embarking on that ser- a new series on the minor prophets for radio. And it's, it's striking to me to realize how much of what these men had to say, while it was directed in a clear historical context, they weren't worried themselves about that. They were looking further ahead than that, and, and what happened then is what's going to happen again. And it's, it just hits me like a ton of bricks every time I pick up the book of Amos. And I start reading along, and I think, this guy's been reading our mail. This guy's watching Fox News. He knows what's happening in this country. No, he didn't know anything, but God did. Now, here I know this. And one thing I know for certain, I am not allowed to sit quietly when I know what God has said, and I know how it applies in our own times. That option is not available to me because God has given me an outlet. He said, here you go. Get up on the soapbox and you tell them. I don't have to have a new revelation from God. I got revelation from God running out of my ears. My job is simply to preach it. As Amos said, the lion has roared. Who will not fear? God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? So what did Amos have to say? Well, he begins his prophecy with a formula. You'll find it in the first chapter. The first expression of it is in verse 3. For three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not retreat. I will not back down, is roughly what the Hebrew is saying here. Now this, for three transgressions and for four, I feel quite certain is a Hebrew idiom. It's just a manner of speaking. Uh, I don't think you can look for any particular uh, significance in it other than for saying, for absolutely plenty of transgressions, more than enough transgressions. I'm going to act on Damascus. I will not retreat. Then using the same formula, he begins to bracket the entire Middle East. He starts with Damascus in Syria. That city is still there. You can go find it on the current political map. To the southwest, he then goes to Gaza for three transgressions of Gaza. And for four, I will not retreat. Gaza is still there on your maps. Then back to the north, to Tyre, for three transgressions of Tyre, and for four, I will not retreat. And Tyre, still there. And, of course, it really represents Lebanon, to the north. Then back to the far south, to Edom. Next to the northeast, to Ammon, which is still there. It's Jordan with its capital, Ammon. Next to the southeast, to Moab, southern Jordan, all the way down to Eilat. Now, if you are in a ship with shells falling around you and salvos systematically, and they have now hit one on every single side of you, what can you expect next? You can sort of expect them to start coming in, can't you? Have you ever played the old game, Battleship? You play on paper with, uh, uh, you know, to ask a person where to put your shots as you're making them in, and you get a hit, and then you know I'm getting close, and that you work your way around it. When you're in a ship, and that's happening... You're going to scream to the helmsman, hard a port, let's get out of here, you know, and ask for, you know, 100% power. And then some, if you can get it. Because you know that the next salvo is going to be coming right down your smokestack. You might decide it's time to change course. And sure enough, in the prophecy, the next salvo lands on Judah to the near south. This is chapter 2, verse 4. Thus saith the Lord. For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not retreat. Why? Because they have despised the law of the Lord. They have not kept his commandments. Their lies caused them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. But I'm going to send a fire on Judah and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Now, you have to understand, now the gunner has the range. And the gunner is really, in this case, aiming not so much at Judah. He's aiming at Samaria, the house of Israel in the north. This is where Amos is carrying on his work. Thus saith the Lord, chapter 2, verse 6, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver, the poor for a pair of shoes, they pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. It's an awkward expression. It basically means they step on the head of the poor. To turn aside the way of the meek. 
A man and his father will go in to the same maid to profane my holy name. They lay themselves down on clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Their condemned wine or wine that was taken in fines. They just drink it in God's house. Basically, the whole picture that you get of Amos, and I'm not going to develop the the, the history of this or the <coughs> details of the prophecy at this point. You may want to listen to it because I do do it on the radio. But it's one of, of total political corruption of Israel at this time. And the images of what they're doing to the poor, they're taking advantage of people, they're selling people out for, you know, for money and for very little, uh, when you understand what they're doing. Now, historically, and it's always helpful, really, to understand, when you're trying to understand what a prophet is saying, it's always helpful to understand the historical context of what he's saying. In this case, both Israel and Judah are at a peak of prosperity and of power. They are not just pushover little countries. They are militarily important. They are economically important in the Middle East, which is one of the reasons, I think, why they attracted the attention of the Assyrians. Disaster, however, looms over the whole area in the rising power of Assyria. Assyria at the time, if you try to visualize where they would be on the map, you take your, your way north from Baghdad all the way up to the, to the mouth, really, or not the mouth, but the sources of the Euphrates and the Tigris, and then go to the east a little bit over in those mountains. And this is where Nineveh was. This is where the power of Assyria was settled across the Tigris. Disaster looms in that whole area because of their power, which is on the ascent. Judah will not finally fall at this, far, at this point, but Judah will suffer the ravages of invasion. Their cities will be burned. Jerusalem will stand, besieged. They will suffer greatly in this invasion. Israel, capital Samaria, will fall in this evasion, invasion and carried off into captivity. So what do I see today coming in the Middle East? I see... Disaster on the horizon. I see disaster not just for little Israel. I see disaster for the whole region. And it may not be coming from precisely the same direction, but it may well be from the east. It doesn't really matter in a way what direction it comes from. In that day, we know it was Assyria. Amos says nothing about Assyria. But what we, what we do have coming here is a complete and utter disaster that falls upon what we today look at as the Middle East. What does it mean? I look at it today and I think, we're going to see the same thing. It will fall in a different way. It will come to pass in a different way. But nevertheless, here it comes. Amos 2, verse 9. Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots beneath. Now, here's an important question for you is a matter of the a principle of interpreting the Bible. How did God do that to the Amorite? Remember? Well, one thing he did was send hornets among the land to kind of drive them out ahead of the Israelites, but that wasn't all. They had to be defeated by one Joshua and the armies of Israel. Israel had to fight for that land. So when God says, I destroyed the Amorite before them, what he is saying is this, my blessing was on your armies, but you had to go in there and you had to do the job. And they did. Now, what would that tell you then about how God would then judge and bring catastrophe upon Israel? Would he do it with his own hand? Or would he do it with someone else's hand, just like he used Israel against the Amorites? Also, he says, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I led you 40 years from the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorites. And I raised up of your sons for prophets, and your young men for Nazarites. Isn't this the way it was, Israel? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink. And, of course, you know the Nazarites had a, had a vow not to drink wine, eat grapes, raisins, or anything of the vine. He says, you took young men set apart to be holy, and you gave them those things that they were not supposed to have, which they had vowed not to have. You gave them drink, and you commanded them. I gave you prophets. I mean, there were all kinds of prophets, and indeed, there were a lot more than the ones you and I know about. You get the hints of it here and there. And you tell them, don't prophesy. Shut up. You know, I, hand out, I come to this again today, and I get this distinct feeling that the times are coming 
when increasingly those of us who are willing to stand up and say anything about the word of God are going to be told, shut up. We don't want to hear it. I can see it on the horizon. It will not surprise me to see the time coming when all religion will be banned from radio in this country. Why? Well, let me ask it to you this way. Who owns the airwaves? Doesn't the government own the airwaves? Does the government own the courthouse? Yeah. Well, if it's wrong to have the Ten Commandments in the courthouse, why is it okay to have James Dobson or other religious preachers on the radio? It's only a matter of time. Now, no noises are already been made again about bringing back the old equal time doctrine, uh, which will affect some of the political commentators. But there's another side to that story. If those of us are going to get on the air and talk about God, are we going to have to give equal time to the devil? Wouldn't surprise me if someone demands that somewhere along the line. Verse 13, God makes an interesting statement. He says, look, I am pressed under you like a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. Now, the imagery is kind of lost to us because we don't do that. But if you can visualize an ox cart, and we're in the the fields, and we're beginning to load up this year's crop, and we cut the sheaves, and we stack them in the cart, and we cut the sheaves, and we stack them in the cart, and finally it begins to overload and to press down and to groan and to even create grooves in the earth where these things go. What God is saying is, I'm getting tired of carrying you. You aren't my brother. You're just heavy, as the old song goes. Now, we're not where Israel was when Amos wrote these words. But we are headed this way at breakneck speed. And God has already said, he's told him, and this is something to understand. There comes a place in time where God says, I have about had it with you. That's what he's saying through Amos to these people. Therefore, the, the, the flight shall perish from the swift. The strong will not strengthen his foot force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Neither shall he stand that handles the bow. Which was in that day, that's the long distance rifleman, the art, you know, the, the light artillery. This was the bow in those days. He says, he that is swift of, of foot, foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rides the horse deliver himself. And the horse was the heavy armor of those days. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, says the Lord. Now I said we're not there yet. I mean, we still can feel really the mightiest fighting force that the world has ever seen. And the young men that we are putting out there to fight these battles are of a courage that just absolutely leaves me in awe every time I come face to face with it. They are incredible. What they are doing in terms of fight is incredible, and no one can meet them on the field of battle. I always laugh every time somebody says, one of these uh, Arab leaders, or these, I should say these Islamist leaders, says, oh, send more troops in here, we'll deal with them as well, and then the, the challenge should really come back. Tell you what, let's do. Let's meet you in the open field. We will send one division of Marines. You send everything you've got into the open field. They will not. They would be afraid to do so. In fact, the, you know, the, the fighting men of Israel had been, like ours, among the very best in the world. Their enemy came out against them in a single column and ended the day fleeing in seven different directions. And the only way people can fight us is behind women and children or from the dark and from hiding. But Israel was about to get a role reversal. Now, you've got to think this through. They were as big a deal in their world as we are in ours, and they were about to get their comeuppance. How did it happen? And is it even remotely considerable it could happen to us? And if it happened to us, why would it? And maybe just as interesting is how. Now, there's something I think you need to understand. What was going to happen to them was not going to happen because God was going to make it happen. It was the natural end game of the game of the board that they were playing on. What was coming their way was the natural result of the way they were playing their game. Not because God would flip a switch on a console somewhere and now their armies are going to run away. It doesn't work that way. How could it happen to a nation? Well, we're seeing something like it happening right now. If you want to understand it, just look around you, keep up with the news, pay attention. 
the elite of this country are becoming so anti-military that the colleges and the universities and the media will, if they can bring it about, completely wreck the military of this country. They hate it. They absolutely hate it. I don't know what to say about those people. I don't know where they're coming from. All I know is that they have long since, in many cases, turned their back on God. They banned God from the colleges. They banned him from the high schools. They banned him, you know, from the courthouses. And there is a natural follow-up on that as men who hate God come into the ascendancy. A whole new generation is coming through our educational system with an entirely different set of values. Where are they going to take us? Where are they going to take us? Perhaps we can hear what that old sheep herder heard from God. As I said, you don't need a degree to preach this message. You just tell them what God said to tell them. Amos 3, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. I want you to think about this. God had entered covenant with no other people in all of time. They had trampled on the covenant. This incredible, one-time, unique relationship. The only people who ever had it. And they walked all over it. God would punish them. How exactly would he do this? Then follows that other verse that I mentioned to you. Can two walk together except they be agreed? It's a proverb, but it isn't about you and me getting along. I mean, we could bring it up, I suppose, and in a, in a, in a, in just say, well, can two walk together except they be agreed? No, can't do it. So I'm going to go over here and do my ministry over here. It's not about that. It's about God and man not getting along. You won't walk with me. We're not agreed. Two cannot walk together. So I'm leaving. What God is about to do is to walk away from the broken covenant and leave them to their own devices. Ready for that? Ready for God to say, okay, you want to do it. You know, you're on your own. You know, you see this in a way, in a very, very small way, with little children. Who, as they're growing up, they come to different points in their life where they absolutely bound and determined they don't need your help anymore and they're going to walk or, 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 or else. And sometimes parents say, okay, fine, you can do this. And you let them fall down and let them learn their lessons and these things. And so, you know, it's a harmless part of learning. But we're getting way beyond that now. We're not little children. We ought to know that that's not what we want God to do. What is going to happen to you and me, left alone, naked, in a jungle full of dangerous beasts? God goes on to say, will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? He's basically saying, is there no cause there's no cause-effect relationship. There's a lion roaring out there. What do you think he's roaring for? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he's taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare in the earth when nobody bothered to lay a snare in the first place? Shall one take up a snare? Shall he go out and pull in his traps when he hasn't taken anything? Basically, it's just a, a lot of uh, little similes that he's drawing that would be familiar to the people of the time. Then he says this. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people be not afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord has not done it? And see, here we come to the problem of theodicy. These men see the problem of theodicy. I think though what they don't understand, one thing I know they don't understand, is that this is coming out of a covenant relationship. This isn't something that's going on with people out here that God never knew anything about nor even never had any relationship with them at all. This is coming about in a people like your wife or your husband, somebody you're married to. You are in covenant with someone. And these things begin to happen. Now he says, shall there be evil in the city and the Lord has not done it. Now, don't sit there in New Orleans and say that Hurricane Katrina was just bad luck. You know, you can't, you better not. Because it wasn't just bad luck. And don't sit there over in Atlanta and muse on what a bad city New Orleans must have been because they got it and you didn't. Do you know what scripture you'd turn to to show that that's silly thinking? It's not silly. 
It's not silly to think that there's a cause relationship between the disasters that fall upon us in this country. There's, that's not silly. What is silly is to assume that New Orleans was worse than we are. Jesus makes that really clear in his parable. Where he said there were people who came up to him. It wasn't a parable, actually. They came up to him and talked to him and said, because Jesus was from Galilee. And they came up to him and said, oh, uh, do you know about those Galileans that were out here offering sacrifices? And Pilate's soldiers came on them, and they mingled their blood with the blood of their sacrifices. Did you hear about that? They wanted to know. Uh, Jesus uh, said, well, suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered this. Nope. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He did not in the least say that these people upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell, or these people upon whom the, uh, their blood was mingled with their sacrifice. He didn't say they didn't need to repent. He didn't say they were innocent. He said they are no more guilty than you. And that means that you all have got to repent. Now what he seems to be saying to me is that there is a relationship between disasters that fall upon us and our relationship with God, or rather the lack thereof. And that for us to start pointing fingers and saying, well, I'm more righteous than you are because you're in trouble, Jesus made it very clear. That's not right. Basically what he is saying is, your turn is coming. And then he added this on the end of that statement. He spoke also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and looking for fruit on it and didn't find any. And he said to the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this tree, and I don't find a thing. Cut it down. Why is it wasting the ground? And he answered and said, Lord, let it alone this year also. I will dig about it. I will dung it. And if it bears fruit well after that, let's cut it down. The message is, there is a limit to God's patience. There is a point of no return. This parable places the prophet in the position of the vine dresser who intercedes with God and then goes out there and does what he can to try to turn things around, warns the people, but who is also resigned to having to cut the vines down if they still don't bear fruit. Then back to Amos, surely the Lord God, this is where it falls in the context of this prophecy, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? So it has to somehow be done. I think there are two mistakes people make when they think about God. One is the deist God. They think created all this and walked off and left it. This is a loveless God. And it's an irrational belief and it cannot sustain faith. Because it makes absolutely no sense that a God with the power, the intelligence, the beauty, the love to create all this would just go off and leave it. Silly. The other mistake is those who think of God at the console. This is a mean-spirited, bad-tempered God. On his console, he has got one button labeled rain, on another button labeled drought, another button labeled tornado, other buttons are labeled hurricane, volcano, earthquake, tsunami, pestilence. In fact, there's a master switch that says, smite, don't smite. And he will hit smite, then he hits hurricane, and we got Katrina. That's the way some people think about it, and I can understand how they might lose faith. Because they are looking at a God who is mean-spirited. Now, how should we think about God? Well, you can think of him as a God of covenant. When you enter into obligations with him, enter covenant with him, he takes his obligations in that covenant very, very seriously. Now, there is a, a statement. It's Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 1. This is a segment of the Bible that we ought to have very nearly memorized because of the importance of what it says to a people and to us as persons. He says, it shall come to pass. This is the promises that God made. This is the whole statement of how we're going to relate in this covenant. It shall come to pass that if you will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments, I command you this day. God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Catch that? 
All these blessings shall overtake you. It's not a question of saying, I'm going to press the blessing button. Or I'm going to switch off the, to the don't smite button. It says they will catch up with you. They will overtake you. If you're walking in this road, not walking in this road, they won't be able to find you. Obeying God will work for you. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They'll come out against you one way, (coughs) flee before you seven ways. It was that way for Israel at one time, and it has been that way for us. In fact, if you read all the way down here through this, this segment, you will find an incredible description of what our life in this country has been like up until this day. It's been very much like this. And I think it's worth giving some thought. How much imagination do you need to figure out where you will be and where we will be as a people if we walk away from that covenant? All the things that we want, all the things we hope for, all the things we desire for our children are in that, that set of blessings that he promises to us if we stay in covenant with him. The rest of it has to do with what's going to happen Just as the one overtakes us if we obey God, so the other overtakes us if we don't. But the disobedience is a matter of breaking covenant. It's not just making making mistakes or committing sins here and there. God does not have to hit the smite button to make those bad things happen. Nature will do it for for him. I'm going to leave it to you to study that chapter. As I said, it's one that we would do awfully well to have memorized. What is utterly fascinating to me in this account is that it is a very good description up until the point of, you know, the end of the blessing section about what has happened to the English people thus far in this world, English-speaking people. But you may say, well, we're not in covenant with God. Why should that be work for us? Well, our founding declaration says this. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to develop, the to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal state to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You all know that. You've got most of it memorized already yourselves. It's the Declaration of Independence, of course. It's a remarkable statement, I think. You would think about this. It's a remarkable statement that about the tolerance of God, that he would accept such a simple, unadorned statement of him as the guarantor of our rights. I think the history of this country is as clear as crystal. He said, okay, okay, two can walk together if they're agreed, and we're agreed. And I think in a strange sort of way, in ways known only to God, I think he was able to carry that covenant forward with us in this country. I think he could bless a nation that made a good faith effort to honor him. And there were times in our history when this nation did precisely that. But it may be as a nation that we are in the process of casting away our faith and denying it to our children. That's where we're at. Since Amos is not here to say it, maybe we should say it for him. There's one more thing. As much as this applies to us as a nation, it applies just as much to each of us as individuals. I fear too many of us approach our relationship with God passively. We are passively the recipients of forgiveness, salvation, and that's well enough. You know, we didn't have to do anything. We couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't, you know, not, not, not in a million lifetimes could we ever make right the things that we've done wrong. But the justification that takes place freely at baptism and at what is symbolized in the Day of Atonement, the reconciliation with God, makes possible an ongoing relationship with God. The relationship takes the form 
of a covenant. And a covenant has got relationships that cut both ways. We enter fellowship with God. And it's something I think not well understood. I mentioned it before. Let me mention it again. We enter fellowship with God. It's not the fellowship of coffee and cookies. It's the fellowship that actually involves a partnership with God. It's, a, it's, it's similar to, not exactly the same, but it is the, the, the same relationship is in a marriage. We have entered covenant, and we have made a commitment to one another. It's a partnership that encompasses the whole of life, encompasses our family, our friends, our business, our personal finances, our home. For all I know, it even includes our cats and dogs and other critters. God's broad-minded about stuff. I think it's incumbent upon us to consider what we have left out of that partnership and where we have neglected our, our responsibilities in that partnership. I think it's a good thing that once a year, God gives us a chance to confirm the covenant with him. And I think that's the right word for what we do. Gives us a chance once a year to confirm that covenant with him. In a very few days, we'll come together again for the oldest continuing Right, religious right known to man, the Passover. In that right, every year we once again confirm our covenant with our Lord. As Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so when we come together, we want to be very careful to be sure that we do remember him, that we remember the commitment that we have made to him, that we confirm that commitment once again, and that we realize we can't walk away from that, and as long as we don't walk away, neither will he.